So I actually got some grading done last night. The web pages, that was worth two points, I graded. If for some reason you hadn't done it yet, you might want to do it in hopes that I might grade it when I grade again. I got halfway through um, chemicals for discussion. So some of you guys have grades, some do not. Um, if you have a grade and again you lost points, you might want to actually look at what I wrote, right, and uh, fix that before I grade again if you want to get those points. Um, I think the Wiley Plus grade sync worked, right? Everybody's got grades that should have grades for those um, assignments that were messed up. If not, please let me know because I'm still having trouble with my online class. <laughs> Frustrated. Um, there'll be two more Wiley Plus assignments. I'll work on them this weekend. We only have 25 points left, so I have to pick the 25 best questions, right, from Innate and Adaptive for you guys. So I've been kind of waiting um, to do that. Uh, but I have plans to get that knocked out um, tomorrow. No soccer game, no kid, so I should be able to sit down and get work done. <laughs> um, the other thing we're working on right now is the discussion board for um, immunology. So any link to any web page, flashcards, or anything like that. And I actually wanted to point out Vanessa's because she emailed me last night and I actually looked at it. I should, will it let me click? I already clicked on the other page. All right, so module three, right, immunology system web link. So this is a discussion board. So that means you post, and then what do you do? You respond. And you respond in such a way that I know you read that person's post. For this one, I'm going to be really picky. I was kind of nice, and I've been nice in grading the chemicals discussion board, right? But I'm warning you guys ahead of time. If you don't write enough in your reply, that I feel like you actually read or did whatever that was that you looked at that someone else posted, you're going to lose points, right? Okay? So, um, so if you follow the instructions, right, you shouldn't lose points, but I didn't go into detail on this. Well, I wrote, I did write, in your reply, comment about the site. Don't just say, oh, that's cool. That doesn't work. <laughs> Does that make sense to you guys? Oh, that was a cool website you posted. No. Tell me what is cool about it. Go into more detail. Okay. So hers was really cool. Um, one way you can <coughs> shrink them up and just see the titles, right, is here. So there's Vanessa's. Why you're still alive. <laughs> I love it. So... Of course, she doesn't know whether it has audio or not, and it does. Oops, I clicked on the button. Go back. But the good news is the captioning actually looks like it's correct, so she didn't get any misinformation. <laughs> Here, let me actually click on the link. Did I click on the wrong one again? Oh, oh no, I clicked on Barrios. She's right, because I lost track. It's this one right here. And YouTube's will embed right in the power, right in the discussion board if you do the linking like I showed you guys. So this one, why I wanted to point it out, is I've seen this one before. It's 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 really cool. They do a really uh, good job. And as again, as I said, we're just kind of scratching the surface with this information in this class, right? Um, and even in this video, he says, "Okay, here's all of this, and we're just going to look at this one section." <laughs> And it's pretty complex just looking at that one section, never mind all the other interactions. So this is a good one. The other thing is, is when you guys search, right, if you just pick the top one on your page, if you search for immunology in Google or any search engine like that, there are 30 some odd ones of you guys in the class, right? If everybody picks the first thing that pops up, everybody's posts are going to be the same, right? If you repost someone something that someone else already posted, you're not going to get points. So if you find a video or something you really like, you better scan the discussion board and make sure no one else posted it before you post it. Make sense? Right? Because I don't want eight postings of all the same video. So if Vanessa already picked this one, you can't pick it. She beat you. So if you haven't posted yet, you might want to do this quickly so you don't have to scan through 30 
threads and make sure you're not reposting something. Make sense? All right. Okay. Because sometimes I'll get the, you know, five people post all the same video. Nope. Okay. So then don't forget to reply. So I'm going to close that. That's not playing, although I had it muted. So for today's two objectives we're going to go over is the next section in Chapter 20, and it's explain the process of T-cell activation, including how the co-receptors, so one thing is, too, what the heck is a co-receptor, right? So be thinking about that. Anyone know what TCR stands for? T-cell receptors. Antigen-presenting cells, right, sometimes also abbreviated APC. And MHC, right, which we know is major histocompatibility molecules. CD8 versus CD4 effector T-cells. What's the, what's the similarities, what's the differences, right? Be able to distinguish between these two different types. So the animation titled Cell Mediated in your book, I wanted you guys to watch. <coughs> but I'm going to play it right now, and it does have um, what he says off to the side. I don't know if you watched it last night. Yeah, it's a good one. So now I want you guys, so hopefully maybe you saw my announcement, right? Maybe you actually watched this ahead of time. Um, the book provides it with me in a PowerPoint format, so I'm not going to go to the online book. I'm actually going to be able to make it full screen. I figured out how to do that. So I have a separate um, PowerPoint for that. And we just got to figure out volume for those of us that can hear. Okay. So as we read or listen to this, or both, right, keep those objectives in mind, right? How are all these things related to T-cell activation, right? What are the co-receptors? What is MHC doing? What was the other one? Was it co-receptors? What's MHC? What's CD4 versus CD8, right? What are the T-cell receptors doing? What are the antigen presenting cells doing, right? What are, how is MHC involved in this process? What's the difference between CD4 versus CD8, right? So be trying to key in on those parts of this animation. Okay. Let's see. Hit the replay button. <laughs> so I'm not going to play now because I've done click the buttons too many times, probably. Here we go. Cell-mediated immunity is the form of immunity carried out by the T lymphocyte, or T cells. The body contains millions of different T cells. Each contains a unique form of T cell receptor on its membrane. Like immunoglobulins, T cell receptors are produced through a process of genetic recombination, which is able to produce millions of variations. Each T cell receptor is capable of binding to a specific foreign antigen, but only after the antigen has been processed and presented by some other cell. T lymphocyte recognize such presenting cells by means of another surface protein called CD. There are two types of T cells, those with CD4 on their surface and those with CD8. CD4 receptors are found on helper T cells, while CD8 receptors are found on cytotoxic T cells. CD4 and CD8 T cells are activated differently. They also play different roles in the immune system. And this one's slightly interactive, so now it's telling me to click on the CD4 T cell for more information, right? So i got to click over here. And what do they call CD4 T cells? Helper T cells. 
and CD8 are cytotockets. So we just distinguished 4 from 8, right? It's an important point. So I'm going to click on it. Most cells that display CD4 become helper T cells. CD4 T cells can only recognize foreign antigens when they are presented in conjunction with major histocompatibility complex or MHC class II molecules. These protein molecules are only found on certain immune system cells called antigen presenting cells. Okay, so there, this video, they're actually showing the T cell receptor. You see that? They've got them labeled. And then what is this now? What's this molecule here? This is a helper T cell, right? So what makes it a helper T cell? All together now. CD4. Right? So sometimes this is called a co-receptor. Right? So watch what happens in this next one as it relates to this cell. So this is an antigen-presenting cell. It's presenting antigen. That's what this little thing is, right? And the way that it does that is it puts it in this molecule known as MHC class 2. Right? That's important. So MHC class 2 can interact with helper T cells, and why is that? So watch in this next segment. So it says, click on the helper T cell again, so I'm going to help, click on Mr. Helper. The helper T cell antigen receptor must match the presented MHC2 antigen. Their binding with one another is the first signal needed to begin activation of the T cell. A second signal, known as co-stimulation, must also occur. Pairs of molecules attached to the membranes of the T cell and the APC cell help bind the cells tightly together and can provide co-stimulation. Cytokines, small protein hormones, are released by the antigen-presenting cell and are co-stimulators. So they're not showing the receptors here, but there are additional receptors between these two cells that will bind. Okay. Remember I said we were just going to scratch the surface? So we're not going to go into excessive detail, right? And again, they don't even mention what cytokine it is released. We will later, though. But what do you see here? This T cell stayed because, first, the T cell receptor is recognizing what? Why did this T cell bind and not the other one? Let me replay it. Why is these, this T cell binding to this antigen presenting cell? What is this T cell receptor binding to? The T cell receptor. It's binding to the antigen. Do you guys see that? It's binding to the antigen. So remember, each T cell is unique. <laughs> And it recognizes a unique antigen. So this is the one that fits, right? This is the one who won the lottery, basically, right? We good? What is the CD4 actually binding to? So there's the CD4, right? What's it binding to? MHC class 2. This is how these two cells can communicate with each other. It's like their secret handshake, right? These two guys are friends. Anybody presenting MHC class 2 can communicate with T cells that present CD4. So ours, remember, 2, 4, 6, 8, who do we appreciate, right? That little saying. So CD4 goes with 2, right? 2 and 4 go together. Again, whatever works to remember these things. <laughs> this is an important interaction, right? CD4 only interacts with MHC class 2. And that is, where is MHC class 2 found on? It's only on, found on a particular set of cells known as antigen-presenting cells. 
right? The only antigen-presenting cells have MHC class 2, and they're the only ones that can talk to CD4 T cells. And what's the name now we know we give to this subset of T cells? Helper T cells. So I always remember 4-H, too, right? 4-H is an organization that helps kids learn about animals and agriculture and things like that. So 4 is CD4, right? H stands for helper, right? The CD4 T cells are the helper T cells. Remember, 4-H. 4 and H go together. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so when the antigen presenting cell, so Lance asked this question. Let me repeat it so everyone hears it. So when does the antigen bind to MHC class 2? So antigen presenting cells all have the ability to internalize antigens. And they break it up into pieces. And those pieces get loaded onto MHC class 2. And those MHC class 2s go to the surface and present at the surface of that cell. So they showed that briefly here. So I don't know how to I don't know how to rewind in this thing because this goes all the way back to the beginning. Let me see if I can go. Cell mediated immunity. Of course is a not. Form of immunity carried out by the T lymphocyte or T cells. The body contains many ah. T cells. I don't want to replay it from the beginning. Form of T cell receptor. On its, it's messed like up. Immunoglobulins, T All right, pause. Are produced through a process of genetic recombination, which is able to produce millions of variations. I shouldn't have hit that button. Each T cell receptor is capable of binding. Ha <laughs> ha. I got it, I got it. So we were on this part, right? Nope. But this is the next part. Oh well, we're going there. <laughs> So watch it again, Lance. I think they show it again, though, but just watch for that. That was a good question, though, definitely a good question. And it's something we'll go over again. Okay, so let's watch this next part. So we've definitely learned about CD4, right? And so this is going to go a little bit further on CD4 activation. Maybe. Hit play. Once activated, yes. helper T cells secrete cytokines. One cytokine is interleukin-2, which is important in most immune responses. It is also known as T cell growth factor, since it acts as a co-stimulator for T cells. It also enhances the activation of B cells and natural killer cells. Other cytokines are interleukin-4, or B cell stimulating factor, and interleukin 5, which is also involved in B cell co stimulation. In addition, helper T cells can secrete gamma interferon, which stimulates phagocytosis and nonspecific resistance. Gamma interferon is involved in both cell mediated and antibody mediated immunity. In general, individual helper T cells do not secrete all cytokines. Subsets of helper T cells secrete different cytokines. The subset of helper T cell that is activated is determined by which defense is needed against a specific pathogen and will also determine which cytokine is secreted. So even within adaptive immunity, we talk about a cellular response versus an antibody response, sometimes also referred to as a humoral response. Yeah, for, as in the human element, right? When they discovered these proteins that we call antibodies, right? They referred to them as the human element at one point, right? So is this, this something uniquely cool that humans did, right? Turns out vertebrates, all vertebrates um, do this as well. So you can kind of see why these guys have the name helper T cells, right? Because they don't just do one thing. They help out a bunch of different cells. And so since this, this, this picture is really important, I actually snapped a shot of it and put it in today's PowerPoint so you guys could have it freeze-framed. 
um, because we're going to come back to these interactions of helper T cells helping out B cells and macrophages um, as we continue on in this chapter. And then they also mentioned that not every um, helper T cell secretes all of these, right? There are, even within helper T cells, there's two more lineages that we're going to talk about. So we talk about Th1 cells and Th2 cells. Those are subsets of helper T cells. All right. So we divide T cells into helper T cells and the new one we're going to find out about. And then even within helper T cells, there's two groups. Okay. Division of labor. We good so far? All right, so now we're going to go to the next set of T cells, the CD8. So let's find out what they do. So what does it say I have to clip on? All right, ooh, so I'm going to ask you guys. So it's click on the cytokine that helps to develop the cell-mediated immune response. So is that IL-2, IL-4, IL-5, or gamma interferon? Which one did they say was cell-mediated? It also stimulates, it's a co-stimulator for T-cells to um, div, um, multiply and divide. Which one has T-cells in the picture? IL-2, right? So notice how many different cells, right, that this talks to. It talks to B-cells, it talks to T-cells, it talks to natural killer cells. So this is a cellular response here, right? Because we're talking about cells. Do you all see that? Lots of cells at that. So IL-2 is a big one. As you can imagine, it was the second one discovered out of the interleukins. Because we release this stuff a lot. So this is our, our um, main cellular response cytokine. So we're going to click on that and go to our next set of T-cells. Most cells that display CD8 become cytotoxic T cells, also known as killer T cells. CD8 T cells recognize foreign antigens when they are presented in conjunction with major histocompatibility complex class 1 molecules. Virtually all nucleated cells in the body, including antigen presenting cells and lymphocytes, express MHC class 1 molecules. T cells that recognize self peptides expressed by class 1 major histocompatibility protein on the surface of healthy cells don't survive in the thymus gland. All right, remember that's where our T cells are educated, right? Between self and non self, that's where they mature. Unlike our B cells, they leave the bone marrow mature. T cells actually travel to the thymus, make their T cell receptors there, get chosen to be either CD4 or CD8, right? Because you're one or the other if you're a T cell. You're not both. So T cells take the thymus, mm -hmm. the one before that? B cells develop from the bone marrow. Right. Okay. So T cells and B cells, if they recognize self antigens, we eliminate them. Because we don't want to attack ourselves, right? <laughs> That would be autoimmune disease if you're attacking yourself, right? Where the immune system is attacking self. We don't want that to happen. So we have to, because remember, how are the T cell receptors and B cell receptors made? By randomly picking pieces of our DNA, right? It's random. There's no way we can guarantee it's not going to match up with us when it's made. So once it's made, we check. Do you match me? Yes. You need to go, <laughs> right? Only the ones that don't recognize self-antigens are going to allow to be leave, leave the thymus in the case of T cells and leave the bone marrow in the case of B cells. Okay, so remember, each B cell receptor and each T cell receptor is unique and should hopefully not recognize self, only foreign. So we learned earlier, too, that all nucleated cells... All our cells in our body present MHC class 1. And this is so that if something bad gets into our cells, like this pathogen right here, whether it be a bacteria or a virus, our cells can pick up and present that information. 
Do you guys remember what, what happens to cells that don't even present MHC class 1? What other lymphocyte did we learn about before that's going around and searching, and if your cell doesn't have MHC class 1, he's going to kill it? He's naturally really good at killing the natural killer cells. Right. So this is our way of knowing if something got in. So your cells are always doing this. They're taking self-peptides and putting them on the surface, but they're not going to get killed by our cytotoxic T cells because those are self proteins, right? But if they're abnormal proteins, if it's like a cancer or tumor cell, right, there might be a cytotoxic T cell that recognizes them. So this presentation, MHC class 1, is found on all of our cells that are nucleated. Your mature red blood cells lose their nucleus. They don't present MHC class 1. They're vulnerable. But they don't live very long, 120 days. You know. Okay. So what do we think is going to happen here? So we've got these two cytotoxic T cells. Who's going to match up? A or B? First one, does that match this? Look at that receptor. Does that match that antigen? No, this one matches, right? So this guy's going to match up. And again, notice, what's this marker on here? This is CD what? 8. And notice there's a little notch in this MHC class 1. So guess what? CD8 is going to bind to MHC class 1. This is how these cells know they can communicate with each other. This is their secret handshake. MHC class 1 with CD8. And we now know and can call these CD8 cells cytotoxic. Because watch what they're going to do to that infected cell. What do I got to click on? The cytotoxic T cell. The writing T cells recognize certain tumor cells that express abnormal proteins seen as foreign, cells of a tissue transplant that express foreign class 1 MHC, and body cells infected by viruses which have viral antigen on their surface. Binding to an antigen presented by a foreign tumor or viral infected cell is not enough for activation of cytotoxic T cells. Co-stimulation provided by the close association of molecules on the T-cell membranes and by interleukin-2 and other cytokines produced by helper T-cells in vivo. So this infected cell alone can't activate a cytotoxic T-cell. Help from like a helper T-cell is needed. Right? Those cytokines need to be released. We need co-stimulation happening. We need information from those helper T cells to help out these cytotoxic T cells. So once it becomes activated and it bumps up against one of these cells that's presenting that specific foreign antigen, it's going to guess what? It's a cytotoxic T cell. What is it going to do to this cell? It's going to kill it. Toxic means death, right? So, here he goes. Click on the cytotoxic T cell. Once the cytotoxic cell is activated, it will proliferate in T cell clones, each expressing the receptor of the original cell. Most of these clones differentiate into infected T cells. The receptors on these cells are able to bind to the same antigen as the receptor on the original T cell. Some of the T cell offspring will not become the infector cells, but remain as memory T cells, which will respond rapidly upon future exposure to the same antigen. Cytotoxic T cells can eliminate cells that are infected or have become cancerous. They also act against foreign cells in two ways. The first mechanism is perforin-induced cytolysis. Perforin released by cytotoxic T cells, punctures holes in the target cell membrane, causing the target cells to burst. 
The second mechanism is lymphotoxin induced cell death. Lymphotoxin, also secreted by cytotoxic T cells, starts a cascade of events in the target cell, leading to degradation of its DNA and cell death. All right. So let's go through all this step by step again. So T cells, as we just learned, are involved in the cell mediated side, right? So when we're getting a cellular response, but they also help out with what we call the antibody response. And so we'll go into that in more detail later. What needs to happen for a T cell to be activated? It needs to first be presented antigen, right? By a cell, right? It's cell to cell interactions for T cell activation. This is different than when we get to our B cells. Cell signaling needs to happen, right? Those cytokines release, those communications, those co-receptors have got to bind. So those stimuli-like molecules are the cytokines, right? That chemical messaging, that communication back and forth. As you saw for that subset of cytotoxic T cells, the true, it, this is true for helper T cells as well, that once they become activated, you're going to have ones that become effector cells, right? That go out and do something. Others are going to become memory cells that stick around, right? This is the awesome part of our adaptive immune response, is they're going to remember this response. So when we see it again, they're already primed and ready. And so our second exposure, third, fourth, whatever, is rapid. Because we don't have to try and find naive cells. We've already got memory cells that recognize. And we talked about that last time, right? So here's that naive T cell with its unique T cell receptor. Once it becomes activated, it's going to proliferate, right? It's going to make clones copies of itself. Some of those, because of cell signaling, right, are going to become effector cells. They're going to go out and do their job. Whether it's release cytokines or talk to other cells and release cytokines, or in the case of cytotoxic T cells like we saw, actually hunt down infected cells and kill them, or abnormal cells. Others will stick around as memory cells, right? So they don't do anything right now. They're like, my job is to remember what is happening in case this happens again. Make sense? So this happens for all your T cells and B cells. We're always going to make effector cells and memory cells whenever we activate lymphocytes, whether it be B cells or T cells. Because they have the unique ability of recognizing a specific invader. So one thing that wasn't mentioned in this video, but I find if I repeat it over and over again, you guys will remember it, right? And I even blocked it out. So when you go home, right, you can quiz yourself as to which cells these are. So they keep saying antigen presenting cells, right? And these cells are needed for activation of helper T cells because they're the only ones that have MHC class what on their surface? Two. So they can talk to helper T cells, right? So who are they specifically? So who can take in antigen that we've learned about, break it into pieces, and therefore maybe be able to present it on their surface? Who does phagocytosis? Macrophages, and who else? She's right, dendritic cells, but that's not their primary job is phagocytosis. Who's another phagocytic cell? Neutrophils. Only one of them is an antigen presenting cell though, and that's your macrophage. The others are the dendritic cells, which Andrea just mentioned, and the third is a lymphocyte. B cells, B lymphocytes, present antigen because in part of their activation, sometimes they need to be able to communicate with helper T cells. And remember, helper T cells only communicate with cells that are expressing MHC class T. 
2. So they've got to have it, right? So very simply, right, a naive T cell has a T cell receptor. It recognizes a unique antigen that's presented by another cell in an MHC. So here it is in diagram form, not active form, Lance. So these all cells, right, all nucleated cells make MHC class 1. Only those antigen presenting cells, so macrophages, dendritic cells, B cells, actually make class 2. They make this protein. They'll load any antigens that they have inside them, including their own normal proteins, into that. And then that complex moves to the surface so that it can be presented to a T cell. So again, this is a cell-to-cell -cell communication happening here. So many, many, many T cells are produced in our bone marrow. But remember, where they actually mature and make their T cell receptors and determine whether they're CD4 or CD8 happens in the thymus. So that's actually why they're called T cells. It's T for thymus. And again, we screen them because we don't want any of them that recognize us to get out. So if they're good, they don't recognize us, then they're allowed to leave the thymus and travel throughout the body. So, comes from the bone marrow, travels to the thymus, and then notice each one of these mature, naive T cells, I've never seen antigen yet, each one of their little T cell receptors, they drew them differently, right? And here's an antigen presenting cell, so who could this be? Could be a macrophage, right? Who else could it be? It could be a B cell, and it could be a dendritic cell. They can communicate with MHC class 2 only, right? Nope. Antigen presenting cells also have MHC class 1 because all of our cells have MHC class 1. So this could be 1 or 2. Notice they don't have it labeled. But depending which MHC this is will determine which of the, which of the T cells it's going to talk to, right? CD4 or CD8. So let's fill in the blanks. So let's say this is a helper T cell. It should be CD4, right? Hmm? <gasps> I messed up. Oh, I got my labels wrong. Why, why it it's not. I switched my labels. How did that happen? <sighs> I didn't double check. So if you printed this PowerPoint, it's wrong. Save. Oh, shame on me. Okay, so if it's a cytotoxic T cell, which only recognizes MHC class 1, this is CD8. And 8, that number, right, when you say it, it sounds like eat, 8, right, to eat something. It helps me remember that that's what cytotoxic T cells kind of do. They like eat, destroy other cells. That's how I remember this interaction. And again, who would we want them to potentially be able to eat? Just about anybody. So they recognize MHC class 1 because as we know, it's found on all of our cells for the most part. Even our antigen presenting cells. But what's unique about antigen presenting cells specific antigen presenting cells is they're the only ones macrophages, dendritic cells, B cells that actually have MHC class 2. Right? So they can only communicate with helper T cells which have CD4. I'm so mad at myself. I can't believe I switched those labels. 
All right. So notice highlighted nice bright colors, very important interactions, right? CD4, helper T cells with MHC class 2, right? And we could even write in here, who has MHC class 2? Let's add us another block. Yeah, I'll just copy this one. What would I write here for antigen presenting cell? What else? Am I spelling that right? I think so. And B cell. Keep repeating them to yourself over and over again. Actually, dendritic, I should write cell. Okay, so one thing I want to point out. So how is it, right, so they have this interaction how, it is, how is it that they secrete cytokines? So right here, right, cytokine production, right, it's going to signal to the cells, right, to replicate. Where's the information stored in the cell on how to do this? In the DNA and the nucleus. So signals from these interactions and others not shown here are going to stimulate proteins that associate with your DNA to actually express genetic information on how to make a cytokine. Right, and they actually will then secrete it. So, co-receptors, right, either CD4 or CD8, and we now know CD4 is on what we call helper T cells because they're going to do just that. They're going to help out other cells, right? They interact with MHC class 2 which is only found on those special antigen-presenting cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. CD8 is our cytotoxic T cells. It only reacts with MHC class 1. This help provides the correct activation signal to the correct type of T cell. Gene expression happens so that they can do what? Mike's make cytokines, right? And one of the predominant ones it makes is IL-2, which induces cell division. So now, instead of just having one T cell, right, it's going to clonally expand, right? It's going to make an exact copy. That's what a clone means, right? It's going to divide and make thousands of copies of itself. Some of them are going to become effector cells, right, and actually do something, like communicate with other cells or go kill other cells if it's cytotoxic. Others are going to become memory cells. So here's some of those cytokines that I said, right, we're going to come back to. But notice the big one is IL-2, right, for cell proliferation um, and communication with, with other cells. So it's going to help in the activation, right, this CD4 helper T cell is going to help out with the activation of CD8 like we saw, right. Later on we'll talk about how it helps out B cells, right, and even help stimulate natural killer cells. So the effector cells don't live very long, right? Um, they're very short-lived. Pretty much once they do their job, they go through programmed cell death, apoptosis, and are eliminated. So as we said, T cells help out. Cytotoxic T cells are actually going to kill um, one of the things I didn't mention in that animation is um, perforin and granzyme. So they can, they can cause cell death by programmed cell death, apoptosis, just like natural killer cells can under certain circumstances, and cause those cells to die. Or, as I said in the animation, they can um, release... No, what was that other enzyme that went and attacked the DNA? It's a new one for me. <laughs> Hence why I can't remember it. That's okay. You can imagine if I can't remember, I'm probably not going to hold you guys to it. 
All right, so, and then we have memory cells, right? That are long-lived divisions. So here we have activation, right? An, an antigen-presenting cell activating a, a T cell, whether it be helper T cell, cytotoxic T cell. Some of them become effector cells. And so here, this cell is killing this cell. So what type of T cell is this probably? This is cytotoxic, so CD8, right? Later on, this memory cell may come in contact with an antigen-presenting cell, right? Later in our life, we come across the same antigen again. The memory cells recognize it. Once they get activated, the same thing happens. Some of them become effector cells. Some become more memory cells. So when we booster somebody with vaccines, like so sometimes you get a vaccine and then they give it to you again later. So we're boosting your immunity. In case maybe your memory cells, you didn't produce so many the first time you got the vaccine, right? Or there aren't that many of them. And so we want you to do this again. So if you do have memory cells, though, it's going to produce more memory cells. If there aren't any memory cells left, we're going to produce more. And remember, these are what's so awesome, right, is they remember and they live longer than those effector cells. The effector cells just take care of the immediate problem. So what's a vaccine that you get boosted because you don't want your immunity to wane on this? And it's actually because it'll, it'll generate an antibody response. Flu, you get boosted every year, but that's not really a booster because the for that one, um, it's the it's a new vaccine each time. So we're not boostering you because we're giving you something new. Okay. Hepatitis has a booster. What's one that's every ten years? Even as an adult, you should get this boosted every ten years. Tetanus, diphtheria, and now they've added in peritussis, whooping cough, right? Because a lot of people missed vaccination uh, for that one, and we've had problems with whooping cough coming back because of lack of vaccination. But tetanus is the big one in that, in that shot, right? Because you're exposed to that um, endospore-forming organism in the environment that gets into a wound and germ germinates those toxins that it produces um, you want to have protection against. And you want to have antibody protection. So your titers wane on your antibodies as you age. Okay. So boostering that, getting those levels higher is better. And same thing with diphtheria. It's actually you're being vaccinated against the toxin, not the bacteria. Where whooping cough, you're being vaccinated against the bacteria. But diphtheria and tetanus, um, you're actually being vaccinated against the toxin and we want you to have um, antibodies against that. So that's why that one needs to be boosted. So if you haven't done it, check into it. It's a good one to have done. All right, I'm done, right? Oh, perfect. I'm like on time.